Blessings, everyone, and welcome back to our 21st episode in our journey through the zodiacal faces. 21 out of 36, I can hardly believe it. I'm Elsa, and I'm joined again with KD Dayton and David Fisher. Thank you both for being here. And we are in Libra 3, and the dates for this decan are October 12th, 13th to October 21st or 22nd. And I can hardly contain myself because we hit our 200 subscribers. Thank you all so much for helping us reach that so fast. Like as soon as we started asking you guys to meet that goal of 200, we met it very quickly. So yay. Thank you all so, so, so much. We're and you guys are excited. awesome because like it, it means that you guys are engaging with us and the algorithm notices it. More and more technology is being able to identify human inter interaction in a more subtle level. So you guys showing that you are uh, interacting with our content through this, uh, subscribing, liking the video, commenting the emojis that we suggest sometimes, or whatever your thoughts are on the videos, it really helps us to grow. And we're always aiming at that 1,000 subscriber mark where we're going to be able to acquire more uh, capital and thus be able to invest more time in the channel uh, so we can make more content and even lives for you guys and that you be able to make it more interactive for you. But even with the 300 mark that we're aiming to next, we're thinking about doing some something special for you guys. We're still going to come up with what that is. But yeah, we've been stay toying tuned around with really... ideas like we were thinking about maybe giving away the, all the decanic images as a bundle, or maybe doing like a special video, or doing like a giveaway or something like that. But yeah, like we want you guys to help us get to that thousand because we can do lives, we can sell y'all merch, we can do like super chats, we can do like all that fun stuff. And we do want to go live, and sometimes like our study groups, link in Patreon below for our study group. But um, we'll do like live sessions and stuff, and it's just super fun. So on our journey to 1,000, help us get to 300. And thank you all so much for getting us to 200. It's our little milestone. I know for most people, they're just like, oh, my God, that's such a tiny channel. But for us, it's a huge milestone. We're super excited. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Because it's, it's growing so organically. We don't really have a huge presence anywhere else. It's just kind of like here. Obviously, we're going to try to have a bigger presence over on like Instagram. So follow over there. And, um, you know, like Twitter and all the places. And I know, like, individually, you both do, but I'm, I have a pretty private, like, uh, sphere as far as social media. So we've grown super organically with this channel. And this has been a really amazing project reflecting as we're like halfway through. It's, it's been super profound. It's been amazing to be with both of you. And it's been so awesome to interact with you guys here on YouTube. So keep it up. Let's get to 300. All right, Libra 3. So Austin calls this the gyroscope. T. Susan Chang calls it the widening gyre. So I was kind of like, what is that even? It's kind of like felt like an outdated word to me or something. So I know what a gyroscope is, but the gyre is like a spiral or a vortex. And Austin talks a lot about being in the eye of the storm here. Jupiter is the uh, sub lord. So we've got Venus and Jupiter ruling this second. And then we've got the alternative scheme of Mercury, which we're not going to talk about like so much, but we did have one of the viewers talk about alternative schemes. But the one in the descending order that we use is it's um, Jupiter. So we've got in that case, the wheel of fortune card, the Lord of the forces of life representing Jupiter, the wheel of fortune card. And then we've got the four of swords, which is the Lord of rest from strife. So it's not like we're resting completely, we're resting from strife. And it does make sense if you watch the Deccan prior where we had the three of swords and that was the Lord of strife or the Lord of sorrow. So, um, and then we, of course, we've still got the justice card for Le all of the Libra Deccans. Austin talks about this being the eye of the storm and how these images here are of like ferocious indulgence. And we were talking prior to coming on today about how Jupiter and being like Jupiter is sort of this Lord of debauchery in a lot of ways. I know we think of him as like fair and just and like all of these things, but he loves to eat, drink and be merry. Also um, inconsequent, right? In a lot of ways. 
yeah yeah Yeah, it's there's some Bacchus Dionysus energy to Jupiter yeah because you know we have that whole you know the whole uh festival of Bacchus we think of it as like a Capricornian thing which it is coming around that solstice time but it's also that Jupiterian thing like that kind of Santa Claus energy like eat drink and be merry it's they call it Saturnalia but it's like a massive Saturn party anyway (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting how Saturn and Jupiter interact in that way. And I cannot wait to talk about it. Like we were just also reflecting being so far along in these Libra decans, like the decans that we have left. We have so many exciting ones. Like Scorpio is going to be so fun. Sad is going to be so fun. Cab is going to like, we're so excited for these next, uh, you know, uh, workings through the the winter solstice. It's going to be really I want to get to Capricorn. You no. Know? it's gonna be amazing it's gonna be so fun because we love we got the devil card we can talk about once we get there so yeah the idea of um minute balances about like how you know we're looking for balance in an unbalanced world essentially and we sort of have to instead of now you have the scales which is just like this one or this one you know like what to engage in here we have like this spiral of just abundance because if you think venus and jupiter they're both the benefics and what happens when they give and give and give we just have this multiplicity of energy that we have to you know rest in the eye of the storm essentially or find that balance in the eye of the storm austin says um there's no more room for naivete here justice must reconcile itself to an unjust world so it's interesting because it says there's not uh, he says um it's not about like dainty pleasures, but extremes here. And we'll get to that when we get to the Pikachu's as well, because we've got violence, gluttony, deviant sexuality, and boisterous joy all pictured here. Um, The capacity in this space for extremes becomes really clear. So it's interesting that we would get some of those things where we think of like adultery or things like Mars or just kind of like when we think of extremes, sometimes we will think about Saturn and Mars or something like that. So here we're kind of faced with um, the extremes that come from the benefics ruling this, but it's also the declining decan. So it's the last decan in that sense, where we've got maybe some of the corruption of the sign, which I think we've talked about a little bit in other decans when we're talking about the, the last part of the sign. So the secret resides in the eye of the storm, calm and clears the chaos of desire and fear whirl about. It's a balancing act more easily described than achieved. He likens it to the tantric path for the use of extremes to further the work can easily degrade into mere debauchery. The principle of balance though is not abandoned here. It's refined and tested. A fragmentary Hellenistic text of 36 years of the Zodiac attributes the goddess Nemesis to this Deccan, and she was dispatched to afflict those whose crimes had gone unpunished. So we see a lot of that. We've seen that in every single Libra Deccan, like something about that sort of crime and punishment thing where we'll see in the judges and the courts and the weighing the crime and punishment. So um, she was dispatched to afflict those whose crimes had gone unpunished and bring low those who had not earned their good fortune, which is very interesting. She also dealt out happiness. She would take care that it was not too frequent or too excessive, which also kind of talks about the benefics a little bit, I think. Um, And then we've got the image given in the Libra Hermetis of that of a snake. And then we've got the Yavana Jataka saying that this is, um, this Deccan engages in tricks of rogues, which I thought was interesting as well, because that might have something to do with that alternative Mercury rulership when we think about the engaging with the tricks of rogues. So anyway, Jupiter being the Lord of Feasts, um, we also have a little bit of that Jupiter-Saturn dichotomy even here, because Saturn takes its you know, exaltation in Libra, like we've said many times throughout the whole sign, Saturn is exalted here, but Saturn encounters its degree of maximum exaltation here in this decade. And I know we talked about it at length last time because of the, so watch Libra 2 for, for a little bit more on that. 
Um, but the actual degree of maximum exaltation is here in the third decan. Um, this, this is a suggestion that most perfect structures are not static fortresses, but they're capable of this sort of proactive adaptation and dynamic balance, which I also think is a benefic thing, but also kind of harkens to that Mercury, that alternative Mercury rulership of kind of being able to adapt and balance and sort of sit in the middle of that cyclone or sit in the eye of that storm. Um, I don't have the card up, but I'm sure Katie will get to it. But when we see in the Rider weight deck, we see an image that does sort of speak to me a little bit about being still in the eye of a storm. He is like not dead, but he's like laying on a coffin, kind of meditating. And he's got like the, you know, swords over his head, which is kind of like this, you know, eye of the storm image. Yeah, there is a saint. Yeah which is the Jupiterian part as well, like the- You're right, of... just pulling this up from uh, what you were talking about, it looks like, um, you know, who knows, is that his tomb? Is he asleep? Or is he- That does look like a crypt. Meditating? Yeah, it is. I mean, I they talk about it as a tomb and it, it does talk about, but it never says like the guy on top praying is like a statue. It, it says he's like taking rest or something there, but yeah. like with the swords like overhead, like coming down on him and him like praying at his- And like the stained glass statue. window, it's clearly in a church or something. And again, it's that meditating on ultimate death that we've mentioned since like Vir the Virgo three or before. So it's just really interesting. And it reminded me a little bit of the eye of the storm. like imagine like a warrior like he's completely in like warrior garb as well like he's in a full this, suit in this other depiction he's still alive clearly but yeah. uh, in the rider way originally it does look like it is a coffin it looks like a crypt to be quite honest when they when they um yes. describe it they say the man lays on top of a coffin but it doesn't necessarily right. say he's in the coffin, right? So that's really interesting. And he's like with his hands like still up, right? So I don't know if he's like contemplating because he has, got, you know, in the in the rider weight, he's wearing like the full, what do you call that? Gear. Armor. Right? Yeah, wearing full armor and like praying. So I can imagine like outside of that church because the three swords are sort of coming down on him like outside of that church there's like a war going on or something like this and the war i think goes... of sanctuary the concept of sanctuary where yes, you have like... to like go within in a way and uh be able to truly find oh. your center somehow because you're like but you are in that protected sort of space where you can reflect where you can um, yeah, that's what totally what it reminded me of. It was like, there's a war going on. All the swords are coming down upon me. And then the ultimate sword that's laying be below is like my own death that I'm having to contemplate because it's right there. And what do I do in those times? Like, it's such a Jupiterian thing to like pray or whatever, like lay well, down I, and meditate on your own death. Yeah, absolutely. But I have another image that I want to throw up. That's a very Jupiterian image. And this, I think, is a representation of the Four of Swords. If we ever do our own tarot deck, I think this would be an appropriate image here, which is the tight rope walker. Uh, I believe it's called, his name is Felipe Petit. And uh, a tightrope walker who strung a line between two buildings in New York City, uh, walking on top of it. That is a Jupiterian image of faith in your <laughs> in your abilities. But it also kind of illuminates, I think, what you were saying, Elsa, about the widening gyre. You know, mm -hmm. it might be a hard thing for us to conceptualize this physics principle of the gyre spinning and it having that perfect amount of resistance and force to balance itself but in a human guys the amount of wind see with that in that altitude like at that altitude and oh no <laughs> i know i know david really Your though and 
you watch documentaries and stuff on it. It's insane. It's I don't like, want to. I literally don't want to. But it it shows that uh, like even this image is like so Jupiter Saturn or even so Saturnine with the balancing beams and the fact that like you're limiting everything, right? You're limiting your your scale of focus so narrowly as to and we talked about this last time with dancing and like you're going for precision and balance but like you said it's such a leap of faith up there like what's that building like below their feet was like the eiffel tower <laughs> right it's like, the world trade center or yeah the world it's trade like center like yeah, yeah. The state so building in like, the background that's <laughs> the yeah or the it's chrysler insane. building or something it's insane and it's like a walk of faith and the fact that that walk of faith you know, sort of needs perfect balance is definitely that eye of the storm, Libra, like to death, to sudden death, you know, just to plunge from the, you know, heights or whatever. It's, it's wild. This is a perfect, perfect sort of depiction, KD. And T. Susan Chang talks a little bit about that kind of like tightrope walk. That's kind of where we started to bring in this concept. Yeah, it was a very illuminating uh, for for those of us who don't really exactly understand what a gyre is. And even, uh, again, listening to Austin as well, it was like, I don't know if I quite envision what he's talking about. But when you think of it, it's a pretty good analogy. Yeah, completely. I think I'll go ahead and start talking about the tarot cards and 36 secrets. T. Susan Chang uh, calls this the widening gyre as... Elsa referenced earlier, um, and the Four of Swords specifically is the Lord of Truths. But we also have the Justice card, which is the major arcana card for Libra, and the Wheel of Fortune, which is the major arcana card for the planet Jupiter that rolls this deck in. So on the screen here, we have a few different representations of justice from various different tarot decks. And um, the far left is a familiar one that we've seen all throughout Libra, which is the Rider Waite Smith depiction of justice. Um, then we have the Renaissance uh, deck, the Renaissance Golden deck depiction of justice. The science deck follows that. And then the Mother Peace deck is on the end. The Mother Peace deck, I don't think we've actually shown this one before for some reason, but the depiction of justice is super beautiful, I think, in the Mother Peace deck. It's actually the three sisters of fate depicted here. Um, those who weave the string, measure the string, and cut the string. And they are in harmony and balance with the animals. And it's an indication of commitment, connectedness, and everything being in, in its place to a certain degree. If you think about like yeah. the, just the idea of like everything being in its place and like perfect harmony, like that's kind of the idea that we're trying to achieve with Libra. And if you think about you know, just the idea of like, what is perfect harmony with nature, right? Like wild animals are coming up to you as your little pets and like you're distributing the water. Everything's like in this natural harmony. And you can imagine that's our idea of like a perfect world. Like we talked about John Lennon, like imagine, you know, this perfect world, but in what case is it not, you know, even if we can find moments like these, in what case is it not the eye of the storm that we're finding those in or those like little meditative moments because I almost can imagine the world turning and churning not in this garden in this space but around them or something you know like to find that harmony in nature is like this pinnacle like almost impossible to achieve kind of ideal that we've set or something you know yeah so the science deck we referenced brief briefly in our last discussion of Libra 2, but one of the things that I really wanted to highlight um, about the science deck in particular is it's so relevant to this decan. Uh, T. Susan Chang talks about how between justice and the Wheel of Fortune, you have the scales and the wheel, and these are two uh, sort of functions of applied physics that are taking place. And this spin and balance indicate something really important about um, scientific principles of movement that are 
kind of baked into the combination of the major arcana cards, again, the justice and the wheel of fortune, uh, kind of feeding down into the four of swords. So um, the more that you move about and the more adaptable that you try to be when we're thinking of justice, uh, the more resistance that you're going to face. Okay. It's going to be harder for you to keep your balance. Uh, so that's why the tightrope walker puts their arms out in order to be able to balance themselves on that rope to become more aerodynamic and become better able to lift themselves off of the, the center of gravity. So I thought that the science deck depiction of um, justice was appropriate because energy is never lost, it is only transformed, is the primary principle of the conservation of energy. And then when you go to the uh, Wheel of Fortune, uh, we have the same idea of the conservation of energy, but it being cyclical and karmic in some way. This energy repeats itself to some extent. We have Schrodinger's cat as the science deck in the middle part of the Wheel of Fortune here. Um, and it's a reminder that even though, you know, Justice may have been the three fates in Mother Peace. Fate is not knowable. The future is not knowable. And that is what the Wheel of Fortune reminds us of. That is what Schrodinger's cat here is saying um, in the science deck. Uh, but as a reminder, otherwise, the Wheel of Fortune is, you know, uh, circumstance, things that kind of come to be and pass away. It's, again, karmic consequence, very similar to what we see in Justice. Yeah, for sure. And with justice, we have, again, Venus. And with Wheel of Fortune, we have Jupiter kind of telling us, yeah, we can't know the future, but we can have faith, or we can have astrology, or we can have religion, or we can, you know, that's kind of Jupiter's kind of principle in a sense. And same with Venus is like, you know, there might not be ultimate justice, but we can have hope and we can still try. You know, that's the kind of cup half full, like, uh, feast part of the benefit the wheels always turning but they're looking at it in this positive sense of like we don't know but we can still have feast while it's here or you know what I'm saying like it's just kind of um that play oh, that Jupiter yeah. does that kind of benefic play that Jupiter gives to this decade when you think uh, of the wheel of fortune and justice card combined uh, I think, for instance, of um, through circumstance, you can't help but need to make uh, assumptions. Uh, when everything is chaotic, when everything is changing, you need to have certain principles being safeguarded in your uh, biases. So you can have like uh, some some security in your actions. like you know what you're going to accomplish if you look for certain, um, if you do certain things. For instance, if you're in a uh, situation where you have uh, no housing, you go, you're gonna go look for those government programs that offer housing, right? Uh, and you can rely on that somewhat if you have a, a country and a government that is concerned about that kind of issue. But if you don't have a government in a country that uh, doesn't, if you have a government in a country that doesn't care about that sort of issue, you cannot make the assumption that if you can't pay your rent, uh, you're gonna have a house to live in, or you're gonna have basic rights met, basic, basic needs met, you know? That's a very Venusian uh, concept of like taking care of the people with exactly. inside of a society. Yeah. And this is justice. You're you have to base yourself on biases. You have to take things for granted in order to be able to deal with circumstance in its most unstable sometimes. And this is what society provides to us or should. Doesn't provide to most for most of us, as we know. <laughs> Uh, but it should, the ideal of a society is to provide us with enough stability through circumstances ever changing so that we can rest ourselves assured on those particular modes of being, modes of acting 
and that they're going to uphold some kind of security for us. Uh, and this again evokes this image is evoked by this image of the saint in the stained glass of the protection upon this man with an armor suit. Uh, he is dressed for battle, but he's not battling. He is protected, which means he's trying to, uh, which means it's someone who is trying to have this uh, protection by having a plan. And so they don't need to uh, really go into battle if they are always ready. Like you don't need to get ready if you're always ready, you know, that kind of story. Uh, and so you can always balance, get, get yourself in balance through circumstance by being ready for action, but never actually needing to leave the state of rest that you're in because you trust the, again, the judgments that you made. You trust the, you can take things at face value, in other words. Or like uh, feeling so positive because you have the benefic shining down on you. It's like, okay, well, I might be ready for battle, but I have a 15 minute break where the, you know, troops are receded or something like this. And not only do I have this armor of like Jupiter on this martial character, right? But I also have like this spiritual protection. And I'm sort of, there's a surrender there too. When you think about the eye of the storm or you think about this meditative state or you think about the benefics being like, you know, hope and faith, let's just say, we see like an idea of surrender. At least that's what it seems to me because you've got the sword sort of looming overhead. It doesn't say rest forever. <laughs> no, you know, I, think, I think a better term is actually reprieve. Yeah. Reprieve is like, you know, the the break in suffering. And so, you know, it's called what the the you know lord of rest from strife. We have to remember that we we're talking about the sword suit here. So it's about action still. It's about that masculine side of consciousness that is telling you to uh shape reality around you according to your own will, you to your own volition. But we are talking about the four, which is very stable, right? So that benefic character that we are talking about here is being able to rely on your own plans, to rely on your own MO, to rely on your own uh, structure for why you're doing what you're doing and have that pretty clear in your head as uh, a mode of protecting yourself against whatever circumstance throws your way. The bottom line is take a break. When you see this card, you have the stability to be able to take a break for a second. And, you know, theoretically, we would hope strategize or plan for the future. But this card is really about exactly what it looks like. Dormancy, yeah, it's like rest. Yeah. It's like, and it's like adaptation. When, when we think about Mercury or just like when Austin said, it's in the eye of the storm, it's kind of like about moving with it and adapting. I see like in the series of this cards, like we have like almost uh, a spiritual seeker, like giving penance here or doing penance, like calling out to God, like, where are you? Like in these times, like I go away from the city and I like don't eat or I don't drink or I take certain medicines and I, you know, I'm doing dieta and I'm just calling out to the spirit for that, like protection or that sort of like space. But he has a space in order to do that. And then you see the woman, the Kundalini meditating, and she has like this protective pyramid around her, whether that's just swords that she's cast and or if it's an actual pyramid or if it's a pyramid of energy with that kind of like pillar of four. But again, like, I'm not sure how much they're planning for the future or just calling out to God, like it's very in the moment. And when I think of like the eye of the storm, I feel like it's very in the moment as well. Same with this oasis. And I'd love to hear, like, I'm going to be excited to hear as you tell us about each of these cards, but in, in the mathematics card, it kind of feels like an oasis. And in, in that way, like if you're traveling through the desert and stuff, like you might be able to get provisions or supplies or something like this, but it's a very in the moment thing where you nourish yourself when the nourishment is available to you, you know? The mathematics card it really shows how there is a structure to everything, but that thing, things, us, we don't need to think about how we breathe in order to breathe. Uh, but it's all architectured in the way as to sustain spirit 
as to sustain something else that is coming forth through it in a way that just doesn't have to think about it, but in a way it kind of had through all the process of evolution to think about how it was going to play out, how it was going to work in order to sustain the kind of life that we live nowadays and the kind of things that we experience in our world materially. Um, so it's very complex and it follows a very precise order, but in a very natural kind of way, in a rest, like in a resting kind of way, you know, it's an inert, inert kind of way. I do think of calling out to God, like I really do, like especially the Four of Swords that's located in the, or the second card in the Scapini deck. Yeah. It's just very much like a call to God. And when you think of like a small break from strife, if you think about like what that breakdown moment is, like you're in the storm and then all of a sudden you're in the eye of the storm and it's like silent or something. That's that moment where you're just like, calling out to God and the reason I say like that calling out to God or that prayer moment or that moment of meditation or that moment of silence is that's just such a that's like part of Jupiter right is just like that's the rest in all the craziness is like surrendering and calling out to God or something like this that's really what speaks to me in this whole thing is just like oh like a moment where everything's like so much and you're trying to find the balance and the world is so unjust and you're just like you know you hit that point where you have to surrender or something like that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's reference to this card being a depiction of uh, knights, you know, indoctrination into knighthood. You know, they have to stay up the whole day and whole night beforehand, or they had to. <laughs> I don't think any Order of the British Empire folks are doing that nowadays, but they had to stay up all day and all night and make great sacrifices, no food, no water, in order to they still do they the loyalty still, to the crown. They still do, like, in, in militaries, I don't know, but the U.S. military, they still do, like, sleep deprivation. And yeah, deprivation oh, yeah, and it's a, like it, the, the sacrifice piece. But I, I actually have a little bit more I want to say about the spiritual side of it, given the other two cards, but I do want to pick up on something that you both referenced in the science deck and what I find so interesting about this card of uh, the Four of Swords mathematics as the depiction is um so on one level i saw this card as saying that mathematics were the details they are the formulas that allow us to understand what happens in nature and the beauty of the natural world um and more than nature also of applied physics without which we wouldn't know these advanced concepts about the natural world but even tossing that aside, I saw something else while you were talking, Elsa, when you referred to it as an oasis, like, sh sure, the mathematics is a very, like, cut and dry, uh, like, hard face in some circumstances, but there was a lot of creativity that had to go into conceptualizing it, and there's a very watery intuitional element that there's a different way that these stolid numbers are that can be applied to something else yeah absolutely I think of mathematics as a very especially high level mathematics is a very very creative very very intuitive mind like I you know in like applied mathematics the way that we think about it we're like oh there's the art kids and then there's like the math kids but I don't really think that there's that much of a difference and I think this is a very Mercury Jupiter sort of concept. In Absolutely. A way. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the, uh, one of the people that we have studied, Robert Schmidt, uh, talks about Mercury as logos and, um, how that feeds into sort of, um, almost formulaic structure behind language and how we communicate. And I really view this card and also the idea of, um the like details behind which we can manifest like a spiritual action in the future like more applied action in the future I find that very mercurial and very logos related absolutely and mathematics really is a language and it's no less creative than in, than the languages of the world that we speak in fact it's like 
you know, it's when we think of Mercury as the alchemist or Mercury as the magician, there's a lot of mathematics that reside in that. When we're talking about language, I'd consider mathematics to be one of them, you know? 100%. It is. <laughs> well, isn't abracadabra supposed to mean with my words I create or something like that? Oh, yeah. Uh, and there's it's that magical concept of creating things with words well when you're speaking to someone you're actually stretching molding their mind in a certain way to think about things that you're speaking to them about right the right now we're speaking it. we're speaking through the internet which is also a mercurial instrument because it allows us like this is basically electrical signals mimicking human interaction you're not actually interacting with me Elsa or Katie right now viewers uh you are oh, please uh, interact with us please come brain <laughs> yeah. you are interacting with the electrical signals from your screen and you're interacting through electrical signals that are sent from your computer but it feels uh, so real david are, it feels so real it feels very real but this is mercury right it mimics things in order to give you the feeling of something else that is actually real and that creates a totally different experience but words are actually the same thing. We put them together in a certain structure in order to, to create uh, an understandable uh, assertion in a person's mind, an understandable you know, picture in a person's mind. Within. Yeah, but it's really getting clear about what your goals are. The Four of Swords is saying, you have everything you need. You just need to think about what yes. you really want. Yeah, but you have to focus on it. It's like you have been anxious, out comes the Four of Swords. Well, you have the opportunity to relax right now. It's not a relax because everything is solved, but because circumstance is giving you some time, you know, to just chill out, put your mind in order, set your mind in order, uh, set your priorities straight, yep. you know? And so the Four of Swords has this quality from... Uh, uh, also kind of Mercury in that other rulership scheme of logos, of bringing your minds to rest uh, on something that is revealed, some image that is revealed after you engage with some thought process, after you put things in order, in other words, after you uh, try to set some kind of uh, order and scheme to things that's when you can kind of relax and just watch them unfold naturally in a way well i hope that makes sense i i definitely um am seeing as we talk through this more and more the alternative rulership of mercury in this decan um but i do feel like there is a strong venusian element here in the stained glass window that sits behind the figure in the four of swords card in the rider weight smith deck the it's very colorful you know it stands out amidst the stone and the gold of the sarcophagus um but i learned while reading uh t susan chang's chapter that the only other um card in the rider weight smith deck that has a stained glass window in it is actually the five of pentacles and in both of those cards, the people are facing away from the stained glass window. And um, this could be symbolic of the fact that they're not actually looking through the window or trying to see what's on the other side, but that there is some sort of like leap required because the stained glass could be in some ways the distortion of light or the distortion of consciousness. So there's um, required almost like lucid dreaming or um, spiritual awakening in some way that could be referenced by that stained glass window um, that that kind of gives it a more of a I don't know kind of like you were referencing Elsa with the four of swords and the Scapini deck more of a calling out to God sort of situation is really Present. absolutely i mean in the five that's the beggars out in the cold it's the only one that has snow and what's interesting about this also a mercury decking yeah but what's interesting about glass or stained glass is the fact that glass itself is mercurial 
but the idea of like a spiritual work of art or something that like brings awe and like uh, ritualistic like uh, beauty into the space would be yes. Venus, right? So yes. it's like you've got these, you've got like the light coming through that brings this awe and this magic because it's art because it's like high art right so there mm -hmm. there you've got venus and then you've got like that glass type of thing which is a mercurial signification but also yeah the fact that like both of these cards are sort of this i don't know they have this like calling out or this um seeking seeking input yeah and vulnerability and surrender yes. in a certain sense like yes. something that has to do with that to like the people that are out in the cold in the five are in a vulnerable place where they have to surrender the condition. And I feel like you've got a little bit of that here as well. Yes. But what I think yes. is interesting is like, you know, Jupiter and Mercury are, you know, in detriment to one another. So I think it's really interesting to try to contrast, you know, Jupiter is the ruler here, which is the one that we're going with, but then having that alternative scheme of Mercury, I just think it's a really kind of complex and interesting Deccan, especially with that sort of eye of the storm, you know, like gyroscope. It truly, it truly is. And one of the things that is so poignant about what you were just talking about is how there is, a, there's, you know, gnos gnosis, right? There's gnosis, which is your way of uh, praising your way, your way of ritualizing your relationship to a higher power. Okay, and then there's ecstatic gnosis where you are dancing and celebrating, but then there's also a more meditative gnosis, mm -hmm. and that is what you're experiencing in the Four of Swords. But by all means, when we talk about Saturnalia, when we talk about Jupiter and the Bacchus Dionysus uh, relevance, you're seeing the more ecstatic version, right? Yeah, this is definitely a meditative version of it. This is definitely a secluded version of it. It's a paired back. And again, we've got exaltation degree of Saturn here. We've got both the benefics. We're still in the card of judgment, right? We're still in that sort of dichotomy of how we're going to be judged. And I think when we're seeking spiritual, like a lot of people, they seek it out of fear. Like I remember Austin saying like, you're in this like chaos of like fear and all this stuff you're seeking god out of like some kind of like penance or some kind of situation you've been through sorrow like if you think about the decan that we did prior which is the lord of sorrow it's like it's in those moments where we usually seek religion or call out to god or something like that it's in times where we feel weak or in times where things are chaotic all around us or something like this um that we really call out and there's a kind of I don't know like peace or retreat or something that we're looking for like if you think of like I just go into a church for that two minutes of like oh or I'm just like getting that meditation in or getting that sort of surrender I could just hit that oasis it's a very very interesting dichotomy to the whole Lib Libra archetype here um that has to do with like surrendering to justice or surrendering to the wheel of fortune or some kind of something that has to do with in order to find that balance we have to surrender or we have to find god or we have to find inner peace or something like this right like it's complicated but and it's movable and it's adaptable but there's something about yeah there's some complexity to that eye of the storm and the sort of religious connotation that it takes with Jupiter as well as what we see in the cards. That Jupiterian overarching theme. Um, I mean, of course you see it in, uh, we referenced earlier the Four of Swords in the Scapini deck, the second from the left being the card uh, that looks like somebody taking their oaths or facing a, a time of solitude or um, uh, retreat in order to gain more connection with their god. Uh, but then on the far right, you have the Mother Peace deck where there is a woman, as we referenced um, earlier, with four swords set around her, um, forming a sort of 
force field as she's meditating. The, her seven chakras are highlighted. Her seven energy fields are highlighted. And um, this, this card really focuses on that turning inward for spiritual enlightenment aspect, which I think even in the Rider-Waite-Smith deck, which had no, you know, uh, Eastern symbolism influence at all, it still kind we of still captures get, that of the era. We get, yeah, we get that. And like when you're thinking of the chakras, you're thinking about awakening kundalini, which is also a tantric uh, path, which Austin did reference. And when you're thinking about the tantric path and when you're thinking about the awakening of the kundalini, you're also thinking about the serpent, which we did have, what was it, Libra Hermetis that gives us the snake? So the kundalini is energetic serpent that lays dormant in the spine and flows up through the crown chakras they connect you with god and that process of awakening kundalini is actually kind of not only is it tantric but it's actually it can be quite chaotic for an individual and it can be like quite movable you have to really move to get into that space where eventually you find that silence so I think that's also it. And then, you know, Jupiter and Mercury and each other's um, detriment. I've always tried to reconcile the idea of like Jupiter and Mercury being quite different because I actually feel like they're quite the same in a lot of ways because we've got Mercury, which is Logos, and we've got Jupiter, which is, you know, that kind of like spiritual knowing. And I know they get to it in different ways and there's a lot of different characteristics, but I think that's really interesting to sort of merge that dichotomy through some kind of like spirited or spiritual or like higher mind or higher, you know, vision that you get with like the psychopomp or the magician. And you also get with that sort of Jupiterian archetype of like the priest or something like this, where, you know, Jupiter is the priest or Jupiter is like all these like spiritual, like, um, you know, like you could see Jupiter in like a college, like a higher mind thing. You also see Mercury there. You also see Logos. Yes. You also see kind of that higher mind, higher spiritual alchemy and vibration there. So I know that they take uh, detriment in each other's signs, but I think it's, they have an interesting relationship is I guess all I wanted to point out. I completely agree with you. And I have a lot of like sensitivity to the Mercury Jupiter archetype because all my shit is in every Mercury and Jupiter sign. So it's a little bit like hard for me to separate the difference between them because they feel so inherently the same to me. But in addition to a college or an institute of higher education where I feel like Mercury and Jupiter archetypes blend so fluidly. There's another place at which I blend, I see they blend very fluidly, which is uh, places of travel. Uh, people who are journeymen, people who uh, travel for a living versus are the like one time traveler. Um, those dichotomies are actually very mercurial and Jupiterian. And, and the church and occult things and the, religious things and spiritual absolutely things and, yeah well, yeah but what I wanted to bring up about journeymen specifically is that there's an element of this card that is related to a crossroads there's an element of this card that's related to you have directions to go in after this that could diverge wildly and I feel as though the four of swords from the Scafini deck most perfectly depicts this um, partially because of the arrangement of the swords and a sort of like pyramid at the top. But um, I would I would like to see more representations of this card having to do with like, you know, you're in a period of, again, reprieve, a break from strife. What are you going to do when the strife comes back? Which direction are you going to go? I think here, because of that surrender, we find that strength, to be honest, because you've got that TP like thing. We've got that pyramid like thing. We've got that rest from strife. Like if, sometimes if you just take a little bit of rest and you find yourself in the eye of the storm, you're ready for that next, you know, and we all know the fives are a little bit tumultuous anyways. A little bit. So, <laughs> yeah. So we've got, we've got that kind of like drawing away or drawing inward to give ourselves again, like you said, KZ, that reprieve. And I think that that is illuminating for us as we step forward on the, you know, on the next journey. All right. Shall we move on to the Picatrix? Let's now disclaimer. <laughs> the Picatrix, my friends, has got um, something in store for us that's a little bit less, you know, lovely. So let's hear it, David. Now, the rise is in the third face of Libra, a man riding a donkey. 
with a wolf in front of him. This is a face of evil works, sodomy, adultery, singing, joy, and flavors. I was wondering, does that mean sodomy and adultery lead to singing and joy? <laughs> Maybe there's, they have more in common than we think. I mean, oh. I feel a similar thing when I'm engaging in joyous singing activities and, you know, and the like. And the other things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the face of evil works. I wondered about this just because of the fact that I mean, I see, okay, so the face of evil works could be Saturn's exaltation. That could just be that because the Pikatrix, I think, goes with a different, they go with Mercury as the ruler. I'm not sure, but I think. So the face of evil, evil works could be that Saturn influence, but adultery is usually Mars. Singing and joy we get because it's the benefics. Flavors, it says, and flavors, flavors. The thing That's about both benefics being here uh that to me stands out in all of these significations is overindulgence yeah. debauchery it's something that at first sight sounds very martian but if you think about both benefics combined it would be like you allowing yourself to do all that you will of sorts like i think this is the stance that the picatrix kind of is. i agree because especially if you put saturn as the ultimate ruler and you think how saturn corrupts things the benefics corrupted are overeating over too much sleeping around all this kind of thing too much you know pleasure essentially to the point where it becomes destructive for you and the people around you and yeah, we've got some of those as Mars significations, but the benefics in whatever position or, you know, the benefics given too much or the benefics corrupted are absolutely that because both Jupiter and Venus are sex. Both Jupiter and Venus are flavor, literally taste and food and things like that. So you just take that and you just corrupt it with Saturn being the Lord or the darkening of the light or just too much benefics we've got venus and jupiter here and there you go i mean i think that's enough to sort of corrupt the flavor a little bit and give it that you know tinge of what the picatrix is trying to provide here really I all think. just too much of a good thing too much of a good thing period is yeah where we're going with this one <laughs> and trying to find that balance with inside of the chaos of the eye of the storm and again you know with that justice card so I think with the nativities, um, let's see if we see <laughs> any of these themes come out in the nativities, shall we? <laughs> oh, there's so many good ones. Um, I was just thinking, you know, uh, a lot of the the celebrities that I associate with Libra are actually born during this decan, and I feel like it's because they're very noticeable, right? Yeah, they're yeah. very noticeable people in this decan. Um, so we've got. Should we just should we just go with Judge the Judy? Okay, Judge Judy. <laughs> Judge Judy is uh someone with their son in this decan, and she's a celebrity judge in the US. Uh definitely formed a big part of my childhood, uh born between the early 80s to early 90s. Yeah, as a celebrity TV judge, she's definitely like the maha, like she's yeah. the TV celebrity judge or whatever. But then I was thinking about like, larger than life sort of like cheap debauchery or like Venus cheapened or like, and I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to offend anyone. <laughs> but we've got one of the most famous Libras of all time, which is Kim K. And she's in this decade, isn't she? Yep. I'm kind of waiting for that. that Very one. end of Libra. Yeah. The, this, this to me makes sense. Also, you know what's effing weird is that I found out that Kim K and Amber Rose were born on the same day. Oh, that's cool. That's is that weird? Because they're both Kanye's exes. So. But I have uh, that. I have that. I have similar things. I have <laughs> same, day. same day. <laughs> same day. I same guess Kanye has a type. <laughs> yeah, that that I think that happens. <laughs> a very specific astrological type. <laughs> I think that happens. So yeah, so we've got Kim K, Judge Judy, and those are the ones that like really were like screaming for me, like as extreme archetypes. Like 
if you had like the ending of a sign and everything like moving to its most uh, extreme or its most declined or something like this, we think of judges, right? That's what we think about. And Judge Judy is like the ultimate, especially for Americans, like the ultimate uh, archetype of the judge that you would see. Uh, so we also have Snoop Dogg, uh, who is one of my favorites. Eagle I'm going to say that again because really. And then also Eminem. Uh, both of them, it's interesting. You know, I'm thinking more and more as we talk about the Mercury significance to like gifted with words in some ways. Um, we also have Jeff Goldblum, <laughs> uh, actor. And, you know... I don't know and I don't I honestly am not familiar but with Snoop Dogg I just wanted to say like obviously we've got lyricism like you said with the Mercury but Snoop Dogg is pretty like not only is he infamous for like his music and like being one of the early hip-hop people but he's also infamous for smoking a lot of ganja and that's also that, a very Libra thing I found <laughs> well because Saturn is exalted here and that's a plant of Saturn so I thought that that was really interesting because he's kind of like known as like the sort of like California, like reefer kind of vibe and Saturn's exaltation degree is here. So I thought that that was kind of cool. I just wanted to throw that in there. That is very interesting. That's good to know. So in actors, we also have Zac Efron, yes. you know, America's like beauty boy or something like this. And so one of the things that I actually found interesting though, that I did want to mention about Jeff Goldblum uh, -huh. uh is uh he's an actor who uh was in a lot of bit parts he was like a good actor but not a huge actor in the 80s and 90s but he became a meme in and of himself for being kind of like a method actor and all in and being a little bit willing to make fun of himself and poke fun at himself which I find really um Mercury Jupiter of him that's like a very um self-deprecating sort of uh vibe and so I found that really interesting about his personality so then we've got Usher and John Mayer which I feel like both of them have like some commonality in the fact that they've got some kind of like emotional like R&B like singer songwriter type of thing is there anything you guys wanted to point out about them and I have to admit, this wasn't a thorough job this time. I only looked at one of the three sites I usually look at. So this, I didn't have any historical figures. <laughs> Sorry. Really, the heavy hitters are Kim K and Judge Judy. I know, <laughs> Kim K. So like, but honestly, even the ones that I felt like were too personal to recognize, I was like, geez, all of the Libras that I love were born during this decade. It's weird. Well, shout out to Katie's beloved uh, Libras. Hopefully you like and subscribe. All right, y'all. It's been awesome to be with you all again. Thank you, Katie, for preparing the celebs and the nativities. And um, yeah, so we will be seeing you next at Scorpio. Who's excited? All right, y'all. Thank you again for getting us to so You can find uh, Katie at com. And, and you can find me at uh, in the first place astrology and Instagram in the first place astrology.com uh, and on Facebook. And you can find me in the about section of this page. Come get a reading with me, y'all. I have some extra time and it's not like as scary or expensive as you think. So just come hit me up. We'll spend a little bit of time together. I definitely want to interact with our new subscribers and our 200 viewers. So please hit me up. Don't forget to check out the Patreon page as well. Yeah, check out the Patreon page. Sorry, y'all. This is a late night recording for us. So we've got that. <laughs> <laughs> to bring us out with a poem from T. Susan Chang's book, which I love adding that little art piece at the end so I was really lovely I know I was really appreciating that during Libra season so all right y'all tell Scorpio ciao so this is an excerpt from uh William Wordsworth's preface to lyrical ballads I have said that romantic poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings it takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. The emotion is contemplated till, by a species of reaction, the tranquility gradually disappears.
and an emotion kindred to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced and does itself actually exist in the mind. In this mood, successful composition generally begins, and in a mood similar to this, it is carried out. Tahiba 